Hello, and welcome to a lecture on the power amplifier concept. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, we'll talk about transmitter architectures. Then we'll talk about what is perhaps the primary consideration in power amplifier design, and that's efficiency. In fact, this one issue is probably the thing that makes power amplifiers a different category than other amplifiers, which we've talked about in this course. We'll talk about a generic model for power amplifier analysis. And then we'll talk about class A operation. We'll find that power amplifiers can be specified as operating in a range of classes. Class A is the simplest one, and it's the one you're probably already familiar with, known as linear operation. Could also be in a mode known as quasi-linear operation, and I'll show an example. And then finally, we'll talk about the path forward. And really, the path forward is talking about all the other possible classes of operation and the reason they arise, which is because of efficiency. So, transmitter architectures. What I'm showing in this slide is the various ways that transmitters get implemented in modern radios, ranging from very simple methods to very sophisticated methods. Simplest methods being, for example, just using an oscillator and varying its magnitude and frequency, uh, one or the other or both. And using just that much, you can generate AM, you can generate FM, you can generate a variety of modes, including digital modes like on-off keying. Or you could use a fixed oscillator and vary the magnitude of an amplifier. That's another way to accomplish amplitude modulation, used, by the way, in some, some applications. And then if we want to do more sophisticated things, it's easier to do it at lower frequency. So we can implement some kind of up conversion and uh, then implement our modulator baseband. We could use a direct conversion architecture. We can use a direct sampling approach with direct conversion. In other words, you can do IF sampling here and direct conversion here. Or we could do digital direct conversion. We could do everything in DSP at baseband, convert it up digitally, and then use a DAC to convert to the RF signal. Now what's in common in all these architectures is a power amplifier, that final stage. And the purpose of a power amplifier is to deliver the power that we wish to apply to the antenna. Really everything else in a transmitter is about waveform manipulation or shaping of the waveform. Where the power gets delivered is at the power amplifier, and that's really the defining characteristic of a power amplifier. Perhaps the primary consideration in specifying a power amplifier or in analyzing a power amplifier is efficiency. We'll talk about a couple different ways the efficiency can be defined, but perhaps the most common one is this one here, which I'll give the variable epsilon sub p. And that's the ratio of p sub l, which is the power delivered to the load, to p sub dc, which is the power consumed from the power supply. This is most easily understood, perhaps, just by doing an example. And this will also serve to illustrate why power amplifier design is really a different category of design from other kinds of amplifiers we've talked about. The final stages of a particular transmitter consists of a non-power amplifier amplifier. You might say a small signal amplifier to distinguish it from a power amplifier. So we have the small signal amplifier, and then we have the power amplifier. The first amplifier outputs 1 milliwatt while consuming 10 milliwatts from the supply. So applying the definition, this has an efficiency of 10%. 10% right, of the power from the power supply is turned into a, is delivered as an RF signal. Now next this example says the power amplifier outputs 1 watt at the same efficiency. If it outputs 1 watt the same efficiency, then the power consumed from the power supply is 10 watts. So what you immediately see here is by comparing these two figures, this is the figure which dominates the power consumption. So the efficiency of the small signal amplifier barely matters. Even though it's 10%, it only consumes 10 milliwatts. Whereas if the power amplifier has an efficiency of 10%, it consumes 10 watts and dominates our power supply budget. 
So this is the key point to understand. The critical consideration in power amplifier design is efficiency. Whereas with small signal amplifiers, which is basically all the amplifiers we've talked about previously, we really don't care that much efficiency, and that's why we never really talked about it. Even though it might be horrible, say 10%, the power consumed is typically a tiny fraction of the total power consumed by the rest of the system. Another way to define efficiency, which is sometimes useful to know, is power added efficiency, commonly abbreviated PAE. Power added efficiency is the power delivered to the load minus the power applied from the input divided by the power consumed from the power supply. Now you'll note that this is almost the same thing as power efficiency as we described it in the previous slide. The only difference now is we're taking into account the fact that some power has been provided to the power amplifier at the input, and so perhaps a power amplifier isn't doing as much work, for example, if this number is already large. So here's an example. A power amplifier outputs 10 watts into 50 ohms. At a drain efficiency, that's presuming a FET amplifier, of 70%. To do this, the power amplifier must be driven by 10 volt peak-to-peak -peak input signal. The input impedance of the power amplifier is 50 ohms, pretty common. Now what is the PAE? So here we're told that uh, P sub L is 10 watts, that's here. And the efficiency is 70%, the drain efficiencies, it's commonly referred to for FETs, is 70%. So we can compute from that the power consumed from the power supply from the definition of drain efficiency. And we find that that power consumed from the power supply is 14.3 watts. Also, we have that 10 volts peak to peak is 5 volts peak is 3.54 volts RMS. So the input power is just the RMS voltage squared divided by 50 ohms. Hopefully you already know this, which gives us 1 quarter watt. Therefore, the power added efficiency is 10 watts minus the power applied to the input divided by the power taken from the power supply, and that's 68.2%. So we see that power added efficiency is typically less than the drain efficiency for a FET. By the way, before I move on, you'll note that I refer to drain efficiency here, and that presumes a FET. For bipolar transistors, that same quantity is often referred to as a collector efficiency. So they're the same thing, just one is for FETs, one's for bipolar. So here's a generic model for a power amplifier that I'll use to analyze the class A case in this lecture and other classes in the next lecture. So I'm assuming a bipolar transistor here I do not necessarily have to do that. I could just as easily do this analysis using a FET. There's really no fundamental difference in uh, the approach. I've just chosen to draw it as a bipolar. In any event, we have the input voltage here, V sub in. We've got the collector tied directly to the power supply through an inductor. We have a blocking capacitor, which is there to isolate uh, the DC component from the output. Then we have this thing, the harmonic filter. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Over here we have the load impedance, R sub L, we're assuming it's purely resistive here, and a current flowing through that I sub L. Now the harmonic filter serves a couple purposes here. One purpose is exactly what it says, is, is to uh, eliminate harmonics, or at least suppress harmonics. All right, class A operation. This is a type of operation you are hopefully already familiar with. Here's V in, the input. Here's I sub C, the output, and here note we're not making the distinction really between small signal and large signal analysis. We're just showing the actual signal values. So here I've got the input, which is going up and down according to a sinusoid. Then I get an output sinusoid with a bigger amplitude, hence amplification. And this is class A linear operation. Now, for reasons that will become clearer pretty soon, we are 
frequently motivated to operate not purely linearly, but rather quasi-linearly. And what I mean by that is that rather than using a small region here, like I showed you in the previous slide, we'd like to use as much of this curve as we can. So here, we're going to apply a bigger signal, which uses more of the available region. And at the output, we'll get an even bigger region, of course, because the slope is still overall positive. Now, you might wonder, why do we do such a crazy thing? Because obviously, we're going to compromise on the linearity of the signal because the slope of the input-output transfer characteristic is changing over the range over which the signals can operate. Well, the reason is going to be efficiency. and Perhaps you can already see this. See, we're pulling current all the time when we're operating in this region. If we're only using this part, then we have a ton of current, the current associated with that level right there, and then we're only varying the signal by a little bit. But when we increase the input magnitude of the signal, we're using the whole available range. So the amount of power that ends up in the output waveform becomes larger compared to the amount of power which is associated with the bias current, and therefore the efficiency should be improving. So what is the efficiency of a class A amplifier? Well, here's a simple analysis that shows uh, that number or shows how to figure that out. The idea is that the collector current is given by the steady current, which I'll call the DC current, I sub DC. I've got a current flowing through the load, and uh, that's a sinusoid. So I can compute the power delivered to the load. It's one-half magnitude of the current squared times the impedance, right? One-half I squared R is the power. And similarly, the power taken from the power supply is the supply voltage times the steady bias current. So I have everything I need to compute uh, the collector efficiency. That's P sub L, power delivered to the load, divided by the power applied from the uh, power supply. And I get this expression. Now, what we really want to know, of course, is the maximum efficiency. That is the efficiency that we get when we apply the largest possible input signal. And so we should evaluate the above expression for this largest possible voltage swing. That can be accommodated in a quasi-linear mode of operation. So what I'm really about to do is compute the quasi-linear efficiency. The linear efficiency would be less. It'd be less by the amount that I shrunk the input level. In any event, the quasi-linear class A efficiency goes like this. I find that in order to remain in the active region, I sub L, R sub L has to be less then V sub CC minus whatever the, uh, for, the base emitter voltage is going to be. And that has to be about the uh, supply voltage. So substituting, I find that the collector efficiency is about one half, which is 50%. And again, that's the approximate maximum. If you use a smaller magnitude for the input voltage, this efficiency will become proportionally less. And I should also say here that in some books, or some people, will say that actually the Class A efficiency is 25%. Let me just address that for a moment. It has to do with this design here. You can also imagine a design where you put the load resistor here, R sub L, like so. And then you take the output here. So here you have the load resistor in the collector current path. If you do the analysis there, you'll see the efficiency in quasi-linear class A operation with a maximum input voltage is only 25%. And there's good reasons possibly for doing one or the other. i just just pointing out why different people use different values for class A efficiency. Okay, a design example. Design a class A power amplifier to deliver 5 watts. So that's going to be P sub L. To a 50 ohm load, so that's going to be R sub L, at 20 megahertz. There's the design frequency. Use the lowest standard power supply voltage. So we're asked to find a V sub CC and calculate the resulting power efficiency and uh, power consumption metrics. And we're also told to ignore the harmonic filter for now. Really, we'll address that in more detail in a later lecture. So referring back to that schematic, the design process consists of setting V sub CC choosing the values of, of the collector choke 
and uh, the blocking capacitor. So really just three things we have to find. V sub CC, the inductor value, and the capacitor value. Note that in this topology, V sub CC is the DC mean value of the collector voltage, V sub C, and V sub C varies symmetrically above and below V sub CC with a peak deflection magnitude of V sub L equals magnitude of I sub L times R sub L. Now sometimes this uh, confuses people. It's completely possible for the voltage here to be higher than the voltage here, right? So it's completely possible for this voltage V sub C to be higher than V sub CC. So just keep that in mind. For quasi-linear operation, V sub CC minus V sub L is about 0 0.7, puts the negative peak at the threshold of cutoff, right? So this is the condition to keep uh, forward active mode in effect over the whole range of the waveform. So V sub CC is greater than V sub L plus 0 0.7 volts, that's required. And we also know that this is the power dissipated by the load from simple circuit analysis. So we quickly find that V sub L equals the square root of two times the power dissipated in the load times the load impedance. And that gives us 22.4 volts. So V sub CC must be greater than about 23.1 volts. In other words, it has to be less than this by about 0 0.7 volts. So the next largest commonly available standard power supply is 24 volts. Uh, you may or may not know this. Po standard power supplies go 5 volts, uh, 12 volts, uh, 24 volts, uh, 48 volts. And there are a few less commonly used, but nevertheless standard values. But 24 volts would probably be the, the industry standard answer to this question. So we'll set V sub CC equal to 24 volts because that's the uh, lowest value that's greater than this minimum that we've determined here. And then to compute the inductance of the choke is very straightforward. We know the frequency. We know we want to isolate that path relative to the load impedance. I came up with uh, four microhenries. A similar consideration for the blocking capacitor. There I get 1.6 nanofarads. These are considerations are no different than they would be for other amplifiers. Although you would have to be careful to buy or select components which can withstand the higher currents and powers that are typically associated with power amplifiers. So that's a yet another consideration in power amplifier design that's different from small signal design is you want to make sure that these things can withstand the currents that we intend to apply to them. Now we can calculate the efficiency, in this case collector efficiency, again power delivered to the load divided by power available from the power supply, that's 5 watts divided by V sub CC, I sub DC, it's pretty simple to get that. We find the result is 43.4 percent. So that's a little bit less than what we expect the theoretical maximum to be 50 percent, but that's expected because we've uh, backed off a little bit here uh, as part of the design. The power supply consumption for this design is 11.52 watts. You can compute that either as V sub CC times I sub DC or as P sub L divided by the collector efficiency. They're the same thing in this case. Now this is interesting. The transistor is dissipating the difference between the power that is provided by the power supply and the power that's delivered to the load, right? Conservation of power says that the only thing left is the uh, transistor. So the transistor is dissipating 6.52 watts. That means that that power is being delivered to the transistor and the transistor is making it go away. Now the only way the transistor can make power go away is to heat up. So this 6.52 watts is being turned into heat which is one of the reasons why thermal design becomes a huge consideration in power amplifier design. If you want linear or even quasi-linear operation of a power supply, a price to be paid is going to be an increased hassle in trying to keep the transistor from destroying itself because it gets too hot. Okay, the path forward. So all I've talked about here is class A operation. I've talked about linear operation and quasi-linear operation. Again, linear operation being the thing that really is more of a small signal concept, whereas quasi-linear class A is really what's used in most practical power amplifiers. 
Now, the thing we're going to talk about is how to make less linear but more efficient power amplifiers work in linear applications. See, what's, what we're going to find out is that there's going to be a trade-off. We can make power amplifiers more efficient, but they're going to be less linear. Just as quasi-linear class A operation is more efficient than linear class A operation, but is less uh, linear than linear class A operation. So that theme is going to continue here. And what we're going to be interested in doing is finding ways to allow those less linear amplifiers to be used for linear modulations. Because most modern modulations need linear amplification. So for example, something like quadrature amplitude modulation, which is commonly used in wireless telecommunications and data communications, that really requires a linear amplification. And yet we want the efficiency of a nonlinear amplifier. So this is going to be a consideration. This concludes this lecture on the power amplifier concept.